do tend to move, so I'm going to try and not do that. And I do have slides as well. So um, I've been asked to talk about uh, Edinburgh University and what we are doing. So it will seem quite parochial in one sense, but that's what I've been asked to talk about. I'll try not to wander off into other fascinating um, issues around the run-up to Paris. So those who don't know me, my name is Dave Gorman. I'm Director of Social Responsibility and Sustainability at the University. So it's a pleasure to have that job, and it's a pleasure to get the chance to talk to you this evening. I will definitely need a prompt to tell me when my time has run out, because I have plenty of things I want to say. First of all, it's not relevant to what I was asked to talk about. I strongly agree with what Alison was saying. My job used to be Head of Strategy at SEPA, and it was my constant frustration that we didn't do more about air pollution. And you know, we could trot off loads of statistics as well. So here's one there. At least five times as many people dying from air quality problems as there are killed on the roads. And I just think, when we're one of the richest societies on Earth, in one of the richest civilizations ever, having the air we breathe kill our children doesn't seem to make sense to me. That's wrong with Anyway, back to what I was asked to talk about. So we have a long-standing commitment in the university to make a significant, sustainable, and socially responsible contribution to Scotland, the UK, and the world. And that is something that I think the university takes seriously. So what I want to do is talk about that commitment and what my department and the university tries to do, to then talk more specifically about climate change and then get on to transport and also talk about cycling as well. So I want to try and cover quite a lot. Um, if you don't know the university, we're well, welcome. You're in one of our better used facilities, so we say one of our comfortable facilities. It's showing its age, possibly, um, but it's still very well used. This university is much larger than I realised when I got here, so we have something like 11,000 staff and 35,000 students. If you scaled us up to be a city, we would be somewhere around about Inverness in size, I think, or possibly above Stirling, below Inverness, something like that, so about the sixth largest. Um, we have a turnover of about £800 million. We have an endowment of about £300 million, uh, and we have uh, 500 buildings and about 800,000 square metres of property. So. We are, in that sense, large. And so I think one of the exciting things about that for me is it allows you to try and make change, which you can then leave it to try and make others to make change. So that's what we've been trying to do. Um, and just to prove it, I don't know if you can see that, that's our strategic triangle that, of course, everybody in the university memorizes because uh, it's in the strategic plan. So if you are, are from the university, you can just close your eyes because you know this. Um, <laughs> But there's what my department is for. We exist to enable the university to understand, to explain, and to deliver on its ambition to be a leading socially responsible and sustainable university. So that's the only reason my department exists, is to, to help explain, to understand, and to help deliver on its ambition. And just to prove with that tiny little, we are here, if you can read that, it's a social responsibility. And this is a little bit about who we are. So we, we hope we provide high quality advice, support, and action. We try and understand and explain some of the issues. We help the university develop responses to these issues. So what is, it, what is this issue? What should we do about it? And then sometimes we will actually deliver that as well. And many of you will know David Samuel, who's a key member of the department as well. We've been at this a long time. I don't have time to talk about the other really interesting things and challenging things that we're involved with. I just want to mention a couple. Food is something that's really important. So if you're passionate about cycling, I can promise you in the university is just as many people are passionate about food, where the food comes from, how it's made, whether it's sustainable, uh, whether it's organic, whether it's fresh, whether it's local, whether it's nutritious. I and mean, I think we have quite a good track record actually. So all of the food served by the university's accommodation services is what's called um, bronze catering mark from the Soil Association. And if you ever wanted to know, we can tell you where the food comes from. So um, we are fair trade universities, but it's not just tea and coffee. It will be bananas, it will be fruit, and it will be apple juice, and it will be rice. But we can also tell you in some great detail about food issues, and that's something that's important for the university. Another really big one that's comes to my heart is supply chains. When I was growing up, maybe I was just a thick or something I didn't notice, but really there was foreign places where things happened, and the news tended to say a bunch of foreigners died, about 200,000, and at the same time, a British man was slightly hurt because a remark was made about the cut of his suit. That kind of level of <laughs> sort of foreignness. I find in the university that's just not acceptable to our staff, and particularly our students, who want to know what is the impact from the things that are going on in the university on the rest of the world. So when we buy a product, they expect us to have some sense of, is that a fair product? Is it a just product? Are people making that product in unfair conditions? So to take an example, I don't know if you can see that, but that's a lot of people working in rather grim conditions in a factory in China, making electronics products. And we've joined something called Electronics Watch. We are trying to understand and do something about those 
unfair conditions. So we would like to be in a position eventually that the £200 million worth of goods and services we buy every year don't involve child labour, don't involve human rights violations, allow collective bargaining, allow property and maternity rights, and all the sort of things that we take for granted. But you'll notice I haven't even got to climate change yet, so let me just speed up. Um, fi final plug for the departments, we do run a lot of events, dozens and dozens a year. I think we get something like three to 5,000 people coming. Um, and there's one, for example, if you can recognise who that is, because you can see from the back, it was George Monbiot came and challenged us about rewilding issues a couple of years ago, and no doubt we'll get him back at some point. So on to climate change. We have a real challenge, actually. Um, the line going down, which is where our targets are supposed to be, and the, and the block are so, where we are. And despite a number of really um, uh, strong investments on a number of areas, our emissions are still going up. And it's a challenge for the university because um, this isn't where we want it to be. We set, we set strong targets um, five years ago and we're not meeting with the minute. So we're going to look at that in more detail. I could, of course, give you the, the, the get out clause. When you look at the relative carbon efficiency of the university, so how much carbon is it per person, per square meter, per pound, that's flat towards going down. And of course, in terms of the climate, the climate doesn't really care about that sort of thing. It cares about absolute emissions. So this is a challenge, the real challenge for us. And that's why that timeline just tells you we're having a proper look at our climate strategy just now to have another fundamental look at what we can do. So I'm quite happy to take questions about uh, that whole where we are. Thanks to people like David Somerville down the years, we've got a strong track record though of investing in decentralized energy, low carbon energy, CHP. Um, we've spent more than 20 million pounds over the last decade on these kind of things. And can, is that, I don't know if that's very visible at the back. Is that readable? Can you see it? But starting out with Pollock Falls in 2003 and right up to uh, investments on Hollywood Road and the Pleasance uh, last year and the year before, we have four CHP schemes with one more to come. Combined heat and power. Yes, what did I say? CHP. Oh, Many sorry, don't sorry. <laughs> Beg your pardon. Combined heat and power. So, Britain has a great tradition of generating electricity and then throwing away the heat. So for any people who understand thermodynamics, when you burn the fuel, it has some energy in it, and Britain tends to say, well, see that, that heat bit? Well, let's throw that away, actually. And what a CHP plant does, a combined heat and power plant, is it takes that heat and uses it for a useful purpose, so it's far more efficient. So for the amount of power and heat you're consuming, you'll get much less carbon. So these are, compared to the rest of the UK, UK, I would argue, quite impressive investments the university's made, and despite those investments, um, we're still not cutting our coal. And that's just to give you an example of it. This is a relatively small engine. I think it's half a, half a megawatt, so 500 kilowatts, going into our student accommodation in 2003. But these are big, chunky machines. A bit hard to understand this graph, but what it basically tells you is in certain aspects that are relevant to climate change, we're doing really well. So the universities, um, so if I could read this myself actually, the, the landfill <laughs> line, yes, the purple line, is how much waste is being diverted from landfill. And as you can see, that's going up all the time. So we're getting to the stage now that we'll be very little going to landfill. The green line is recycling. It took a dip because we had a problem with the contract. It's back up again at about 75%, I think it is. And the orange one, which is suddenly rising, is reuse. So again, we're doing an awful lot in the university in terms of recycling. But the next stage beyond recycling is to actually start reusing products and to actually remanufacture products in a whole circular economy discussion. And that's what my next slide is about. We, for example, have something called Warpit, uh, the waste reuse portal within the university. We've got 400 uses of that. We're just starting out. Saved us about 60,000 so far. It's about 100 PCs reused. About uh, 100 tons of carbon saved, but the real thing is that we're getting people to stop, to get out of this habit we've developed over the last 30 years or so, of saying, well, I'll buy something, oh, that's three years, I'll get rid of that and get something else, and to start trying to reuse and broker uh, better resource efficiency across the university. Something very contentious, which I'm very happy to discuss uh, with anybody, is about investments. We signed up to some principles for responsible investment in uh, 2013. We've had a lively discussion with our students in particular about what that means, because um, we have about 300 million pounds of investments, which is the third largest in the UK universities. We have done an awful lot of work around that, and I'm very happy to talk about that, but I just flag it, because I don't have time to go into any detail. One of the things we're trying to do is, um, as somebody just pointed out, it can get quite dry and technical when you start talking about carbon emissions and CHP and scope three. 
One of the things that our senior vice principal, Charlie Jeffries, has been being keen on is to launch something called Edinburgh Action for the Climate. Just starting out, the idea is that we'll harness all of the expertise of the university. So we have some world-leading expertise on climate change and climate science and renewable energy and carbon capture and storage. But they're often out sorting other people's problems and they're not sorting my problems. And so we're trying to turn that back in on the university to some extent and say, why don't we harness some of that? And why don't we make sure that our teaching matches our commitment on climate generally? And how can we help the city become more of a hub in some of this stuff? So this is just starting for us, but we do think it's quite exciting. We will be well, well represented in Paris uh, uh, over the next few weeks. Again, one of the things I had no idea about until I came to Edinburgh is the sheer range of research and teaching that's going on. We're an unusual university in that sense. Many universities these days are specialising, uh, but we're actually doing quite a bit across a whole range of things, and you can pick out one or two famous people there. And so just finish, finish on some sort of general um, climate change stuff. One fantastic example, this is the, the flow wave tank. Has anybody heard of the flow wave tank? Yeah, one or two. It's well worth a visit if you, if you haven't heard. Basically, okay, we've had some difficulties with marine renewables over the last few years, but one of the things you need to have a successful industry is to be able to test at scale how these things are going to work. And in the old days, the testing tanks were like swimming pools. It's quite hard to model the conditions. This is a circular tank that will allow you to, to simulate wave and tidal conditions that are very realistic. And it's down at King's Buildings in the centre of Edinburgh. This will, I think, I'm convinced anyway, eventually kickstart an entirely new industry. And I think that's fantastic that the university is doing that sort of thing. Downside, that's a megawatt of electricity. So when I was talking about cutting our emissions, in one sense we're saying, isn't it fantastic we're helping to develop the solutions? And then for my job, it's like, oh, but that's another megawatt's worth of power. Um, so onto sustainable travel. I'm not sure what I'm going to talk about. I can't take any credit for it, but I know she won't be able to point out. There she is. Emma Crowther in the audience is our transport manager, and I think we've got to pay credit to Emma for many of the fantastic initiatives the university is doing on this sort of stuff. So we have a travel and transport planning policy from 2010. As you can see, they're committed to develop and implement innovative travel plans, reduce carbon emissions, and that's succeeding. On the commuting side, the, the, the amount of carbon per person is falling, as you can see, by 35%, so that's great. And Emma does a, a staff and travel survey every two years that gives us information about that. And what does it tell us? It tells us that we have a modal split that I think many organisations would kill for. So 88% of staff and students walk, cycle, or use public transport. The proportion of staff and students who are using these modes of transport is going up all the time. 11% um, of our staff or students cycle every day. And yet, even with that, we still almost 10,000 tonnes coming from our commuting. So even when we're doing well, there's, there's still a fair amount of carbon. In terms of cycling, um, we have developed recently the e-cycle scheme. I tried my first ever electric bike recently, I was just saying, oh, I'm not a great cyclist, but it was just wonderful. I know it has some carbon emissions, and it's not as good as a normal bike in that sense, but it was still wonderful. And we've been developing those e-cycle schemes, I think, and it's slow start maybe, but they're there, and that will encourage people, we hope, to move across the we've got five campuses. And if you are one of those people who doesn't want to take the taxi or the, or, or the car, but has a, just enough stuff that is actually quite heavy and difficult to use the bike, this might be a solution for you. Um, we have a, a student bike scheme called Unicycles, which I'll talk about in a minute. There's a free bike registered, there's subsidised D-locks, there's a cycle to work scheme, all the stuff you might expect is in place. Um, we will provide, so our department working with them are in particular um, secure and sheltered cycle parking and there is, well, I'll talk to you later, Kirsty, there is one nearby actually, um, free bike toolkits, free doctor bike sessions, cycle training for people like me who are not very confident within the city cycling at all, I should really go one of these things, um, bike, bicycle user groups for those people who are trying to um, Reflect back to us the experience of cycling across the campuses or some of the issues or providing moral support to each other. So I think there's an awful lot going on in the university to try and support sustainable travel and cycling. <coughs> and there is a picture of Emma with one of my colleagues from the SRS department, Alan Petty, and uh, presumably pleased student who's got one of these unicycles. So let's let me just spend a minute or two on what they are. This is a cycle hire scheme. Because it's the university and it's bicycles, it's unicycles, see? Um, uh, selected by Cycling Scotland to be one of our one of its partner institutes, so we, we thank them for giving us the grant. Um, it's based at Pollock Halls, which is where most of our first year students are. I can't remember how many there are, but there's several thousand there. Um, 
two and a half, in fact, tells you that, doesn't it? Two and a half thousand, many of them new to the city, and many of them wanting to discover the city and use bicycles to do so. And so we've got Trinity, and you'll be, I'm not a cyclist, you'll be able to tell me, Ridgeback Hybrids, is that a good? Yes. Oh, I saw some nods, oh, and some envy in the audience, perhaps. Um, the way it works is you pay a fee, £30 for a semester plus a deposit. Um, we also work with Shrub, the, the student reuse cooperative based at... Um, Guthrie Street. Thank you very much. Um, and they will run some, some uh, we, uh, cycle skills classes as well. I think it's Emma's words here to say, this is just the starting point now. This is us responding to the desire for sustainable travel, but also responding to the student desire to do more on cycling. They seem to be going like hotcakes is the, is the feedback I've been getting. So we'll obviously have a look at how that works and whether that could be replicated in other parts. And uh, Track will be doing some work, I think, towards the end of the year to try and evaluate that for us, but it seems to be going well. I think I might have covered a lot of this, actually. Oh, yeah, so observations about the scheme so far from the kind of initial learning. A lot of the, the users are non-UK students. Um, where they maybe come from, culture where cycling is the norm, but obviously if you're coming from certain parts of the world, you're not that likely to bring your bike with you, so this is an opportunity for them to get a bike. Um, seems to be attracting people of all different abilities, which is great, uh, and again, it's maybe something I should be doing more, um, and we're having no problem in handing it out as we're saying. So I think another example of our commitment on that. Just to wrap up with some of the other aspects of transport. Um, We've been slowly replacing our diesel. How am I doing for time? Well, you're one minute over now. Okay, right, so I will finish in the next two minutes. Um, gradually introducing hybrid and electric vehicles. Our emissions from uh, our vans and uh, our, our vehicles is not, it's not massive, but again, it's a signal, isn't it, really? So we're trying to do more there. We've got seven electric vans and 12 uh, petrol hybrid vehicles. And importantly, we've got charging points. We're helping out the City Car Club with these charging points, these electric charging points as part of this beginning to make a change. Um, final thing to say, again, of course, I could have not showed you this slide, but we're terribly honest and transparent. Despite all that great stuff on sustainable transport, the biggest issue for us in terms of transport is aviation. So we, something like 10,000 tonnes coming from um, our business travel, of which 90% is aviation. And it's a real issue for the university because you can't really be an academic in many ways. If you're dependent on field work in, in Mexico as an archaeologist, it is difficult to ask you to get a boat um, and, and to go and do it. Some people do, or take a train. However, we do think that there are opportunities. So not everybody needs to hop in a plane all the time. So we've finished on this. We've developed some sustainable travel guidance. We've begun to put in context for people the carbon impacts of their choices. And what that little tag on the bottom is showing you really is, well, first of all, don't, don't travel. Think about video conferencing. Think about teleconferencing. Think about the bike. And at the bottom, think about flying. And so that's one of our big challenges coming forward. So thank you very much for your attention.